We are back here at the Shifting Focus podcast with one of our favorite people ever, Blast from the Past, Jamie Donahue, director, oh. writer. Where are you coming from? Am I one of your favorite people? Yeah, we All love right. you. How long have we known each other? Oh my gosh. When when was the Alex Claire music video? Oh, that Don Diablo. Was Don that the Diablo, first time? was it? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Was that the first time we connected? That was, yeah, and you let me stay in your apartment. This was before you mm -hmm. two lived together. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. And you, we had the little studio that you lived oh, in. Oh, yeah, right? you had the studio apartment. Yeah, were, yeah it was like a tiny little house. So uh -huh. you, were, you were staying with me every night anyway. So we we're like, Jamie, just take that as your own. And you, I, re I always remember, and you showed me the TV in the remote, and he said, and this is Netflix. And I said, what's Netflix? Because <laughs> we didn't have Netflix in the UK. It must have been right at the early time when it came from DVDs so onto like that? Like, like 2011, maybe? Something like that. Did yeah. you guys do two projects out here? You did. Yeah, we did. Because Adam did the real music. The real. Yeah. Were you here with that mm -hmm. one when we went up to Joshua Tree? No. Got that arrested. Was <laughs> no, um, but yeah, that's when we met through there, and I stayed at your place. Okay, that was so fun. I remember that little place? That oh, was great. good memory. Remember that was right. right? Little yeah. balcony, okay, little yeah. kitchenette. So that had to have been thirteen years ago. Yeah, so two thousand eleven was my guess. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So to to, to wrap that all in together for yeah, people, people listening, who don't know. you're mm -hmm. coming all the way from Leeds. Which well, I mean, I live in London now. Okay, that's but, right. I came yeah, yeah. with you in London we, when we mm -hmm. came out. You've yeah. been there for how long? How long ago was that? I don't know. I mean, I've lived in London for 10 years, mm -hmm. but I'm yeah. born and bred in Leeds. I'm proper northern still. It never yeah. leaves you. And you're world famous for your judo. <laughs> I don't know if I'm world famous. That's. <laughs> I wish I was world famous. Do you know what? If I could have done it all again, I still judo's my love. <laughs> Is it? Uh, yeah, I just think I, it's weird. Like, have you got like when people always say, "Oh, you you're a director. Did you want to do this your whole life? This is always your focus and everything." It's like, no, not at all. I never even thought about it. It was always judo. Mm -hmm. So since the age of three, it's like judo's like being in our blood really? because it came. Yeah, because we've got a direct lineage. That's how you say it to the creator yeah. of judo lineage. <laughs> lineage. So. Um, We've got like Dr. Jigoro Kano created it and he had a student called Otani who came over to England who taught Ron Anderson, who taught uh, my father. My father taught me. Oh, so literally your yeah, dad yeah. was, I didn't know that. Shidoka master. Mm. Yeah. That's and amazing. Randomly, my, and then Ron Anderson was the grandfather of my best friend, Phil, who lives over here, which is the reason I'm here at the moment. And it's all tied together because it's of all judo. tied together with judo. Yeah, and you thought yeah. I was messing with him. I when did. I, said that. Yeah. I thought you were being a silly. No. I forgot yeah. about that. So um, yeah, I don't do it as much anymore. Mm. But it's in your bones and your it's blood. Like bones. you can just pick it up, like riding a bike. Yeah. So and your bicep working. vein is like blinding me is over it? here. <laughs> do you know? Well, I was always I was always into the gym, uh -huh. and then because I was I've worked I did three years back to back without a break doing TV. Um, See, so it's really hard working out and then, mm -hmm. you know, you're up and down Burned all the out. time. Um, and then I saw a behind the scenes video of me directing Doctor Who. Oh, and I was like, look at the size of that ass. That is not good. <laughs> it's not good for anybody. And then my yeah. girlfriend was like, yeah, I don't want to tell you, but you look like a potato. Whoa, she even doubled down. And I was like, shit. So she I've called got a, you a potato? Yeah, but she was right. It was like a potato ass. It was not good. And I was like, what's happened? I've always been in shape. So I took a few months off doing writing and I just went and smashed it back at the gym. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I Sorry. dieted for the first time. What did you think about that? I did, I worked with my Fitbit and then I did the calorie deficit thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. essentially calories in, calories out. That's the, main, that's the yeah. main thing you were focusing on. And then While progressive training. overloading on the weights and walking. And I still play football, soccer twice so, a week. So well. you've worked out of shape and in shape. Mentally, what's the difference that you feel in your life when you're actually like not a potato? <laughs> It's like, I don't know, like the gym thing's a weird thing. Like, do you, I always like I, that question of if you didn't have to go to the gym, but you were always ripped and in shape, would you still go to the gym? And I don't know. I don't know either. But then also mentally, do you feel better knowing that you just worked hard and you have that accomplishment of knowing you could do th hard things that led you to this point? It's, there's kind of a mental unlocking that happens. 
But like you said, he, if you already look good, you're like, hmm, what do I care? It's like the worst, working out is like, I don't know, it's the worst hobby in the world, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Because there's, you can lose it all in two weeks. There's no way of completing it in any way. Yeah. And it is, even if you keep going, there's a slow, like, degrading yeah. of your body. So yeah. it's not, but you've you've got to do it, really. I used yeah. to love it. I'd go to the gym voluntarily. All, I mean, I loved it. I was a gym rat. I enjoyed it so much. And then when I competed and it's something I had to do instead of something I wanted to do, stripped all the joy and i had i don't think i've been in the gym became a, j a job again yeah it became mm -hmm. something i had to do and i hated it the last thing i wanted to do is get up and go to the gym to this day if i say you want to go to the gym she's like why would you ask me that do you think i'm fat i'm like i'm, now I'm just gonna ask asking you, you now i'm gonna ask you if i look like a potato oh, i love potatoes <laughs> You've got a little baby potato. That's all potato. good. A when new get, potato. When you get pregnant, both grow. Like you go this way. Yeah. So my butt went from this to. I'm like I say it's like the Nutty Professor. Remember when he was transitioning yeah, in yeah. the movie? And his gut goes out and his butt goes out. That's that's pregnant. Nuts and life. butts. Um, guts and butts. Oh, guts. Sorry. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, you need the gym. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you're like, I got. To, I think I met David Yates, who uh, directed. He's like big film director and he got I got to ask him one question when I was younger as well and he's like I was like what's your advice for directing and he's like stay healthy yeah he's like physically healthy and people don't realize when you're on set the drain it takes from you as well it is like I sometimes say working in a factory for like 10 hours could be easier as well people think you're just sitting in your director's chair and not mm -hmm. but there's a mental and physical drain mm -hmm. on you so keeping healthy and doing stuff like that, I think is what keeps you going through it as well. So I always took that on board. And it's for so people true. who haven't been on set and don't know well, anything about up. the He's directors. A director and writer. Well, hold on. Who don't know about <laughs> a day in the life and the director, mm. how could you describe it? Like, could you walk us through what a day in the life is like for a director? Because, yeah, you think you're just sitting in a chair. It's... Um, it, I suppose it depends what you're directing. I've been doing a lot of television recently, so I do a lot for streamers, for Netflix and Disney. Um it's it's you need this complete love of what you do but it is huge pressure on you all the time it's like um and you will work from you might get up at six be on or get there for six be on set for seven and then you'll work through to for till 12 14 hour days and then you'll get back and then you'll have prep for the next day as well so it's just relentless yeah and you do it in so like in England, I might shoot for like a couple of months. So it completely, I always say it takes a bit of your soul okay. when you take on a project and it takes that out of you. And it's essentially, I don't know, there's a lot, a lot of different ways. You get asked like a thousand questions a day. But the thing is with directing is there's no right or wrong answer. Everything is just taste as well. So you've got to, I've learned over the years to use your gut and make decisions on your gut as yeah. well and you've just got to go with it and you also you can never you've got all these people underneath you and you've just got to you all they want is a clear decision mm -hmm. so you've just got to commit to a decision and go with it because essentially it's your vision right you're you have the director of photography who's capturing what's in your brain trying to get what's that in your brain out into the to the Their lens or... yeah camera operator, whatever it is. Right. And then you have all these assistants and then you're lighting and then you've got your set designers and your actor and you're having to direct your actors and make sure they're hitting their marks. Meanwhile, you have to make sure the shot is good and you're staying on budget and you're staying on schedule. It, it seems like there's just a lot of moving parts that people don't think about. Not so it's it's so technical a lot of it and it's so much of a grind and it's absolute chaos like i i was on the outside for so long and you've got this view of like hollywood and what films and tv mm -hmm. are like and then yeah. you finally break through to the other side and you're in it you're like oh this is what it's like and it never it never surprised me how professional it is but how completely <laughs> unprofessional it is it's yeah. absolute chaos yeah. there's still a the human time. element to no matter how yeah. big you made it, there's still a human element of chaos and crazy and someone's not doing yeah. their job. Completely. And You're the bigger the bigger it gets, sometimes the more chaos it is. Mm -hmm. And it's all just it's all on time. Everything mm -hmm. costs so much money. Mm -hmm. Like you <laughs> you go over by thirty seconds, it can cost tens of thousands of pounds so you've got that constant pressure on you mm -hmm. um, and your executive producers are there mm -hmm. like what are you doing yeah. and then you have to do your post-production where you're sitting there at the editor the whole time making sure it, yeah. there's a lot about the director that i don't think people realize goes into yeah. your job what's the main traits that a director needs to have to be a good director you think and would you consider yourself a good director 
I'd hope so. <laughs> I don't know. You have to ask. It's, it's weird what other people think a good director is. Yeah. A lot of crew members are, if you finish early, you're a good director. Yeah. Uh-huh. But that's not. And it's very hard to describe what a director does because they have their hands in absolutely everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but what makes a good director? Um, so what makes a good director? I think, um, I think clarity of decision and making a real clear decision going forward yes Mm -hmm. this is what we're doing and everybody's on board with that as well decisiveness complete decisiveness um but also flexibility in that as well you've i think you've got to lose your ego because somebody else might have a great idea and let that idea come in because ultimately it could make the vision and everything better as well so that's one thing i think people management is a lot of it Mm -hmm. um trying to find the what makes people tick and everybody everybody's different so with every actor they're completely different as well and what i try and what i try and do is speak to the actors and go how can i make this environment the best it can be in order that you can do your job the best Mm -hmm. and i just think it's about empowering people um and i always say for me what makes a good director or a producer is recognizing your own weaknesses and the strengths of others around you. So that's my philosophy on it. That's great. Yeah, it's very nice actually. Would you say the director needs to know how almost all of it works too, like everyone's job, kinda? Completely. And when I have a lot of people from film school asking me, what I always say is learn every single part of the industry because every decision you make will affect somebody in a different way. You say, I want this sh- this big shot that comes from there to there. But you have to understand that in the grip department that what you're asking them is to lay track down mm-hmm. over really hard ground. And it could it could take them 40 minutes. And at the same time, if I ask a camera to be there and a camera to be there, I really want that shot, which will be great for the camera team. But I'm messing up the sound team because they can't physically like you can't record sound on two different shots mm-hmm. um and so it, it's all yeah there's there's a lot of different factors and you're balancing them all as well so you've knowing every single part of it you don't have to be an expert on it but understanding i think it's more what your decisions how they really land on other people mm-hmm. i get that yeah me too do, yeah. do you want to go back to the beginning now yeah so okay, go ahead. those who haven't caught on you're a director <laughs> Writer, producer, right? That's yep. kind of the main three. And then what got you into that from being a three-year-old aspiring to be a you know judo master? It all came from judo as well, which was, I th- think I was maybe 15 or 16. Mm. And we used to do these big judo contests and like cameras had come out then. And we were, we were like, oh, we could film this. And we had a, one of the kids at, in our judo class, their dad worked for a company called Provision in Leeds, which was a facilities company. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, I can lend you some cameras, some professional ones. And he came down with this full kit. We had, we had all these cameras, three different angles and all the TVs and everything. And it was amazing. And I got the bug from it there. Um, and then also one part of my family was in theatre. Mm-hmm. So it was always sort of sat there yeah. as well. And then I... Um, yeah, and then I decided to go go into the filming side of things. I took okay. a year out and I learned to be like a camera assistant in a proper old school set and I got treated awfully and I had to carry everything <laughs> and I got a real lesson in, in yeah. the old school ways of filming, the hierarchy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And getting, getting like chum. Getting abused, but also being like, I love it. Oh my God, I've it been abused. Exactly I have been abused in Hollywood. I've been shoot out. I have stories. We've mm. talked about that. What was the show that just came out with the Nickelodeon? Oh, Did yeah. you see that One series the, about the pedophiles that were on set on Nickelodeon? Oh, no, I stuff. haven't. I've worked with some of those people. <laughs> yeah, when she was in Hollywood. And one of the guys really was so likable and he was great with kids and you would never know. Because when, we like were, when I was working with set. Disney, was it Disney or Nickelodeon, I think? It was Disney when he went over, I think. When I when after. Saw, yeah. yeah. And he was wonderful. I mean, you would never have thought that he would have been in that situation. But they talk about the industry and how people have to pay their dues and how it's abuse 
But in a way, that's also how you learn. I'm not making excuses for the verbal abuse that happens out there. Because, there's a there's a fine line between yeah. the two things. I've been chewed out more time. I mean, stupid, stupid, stupid stuff. I've watched directors' kids. I babysat them because it was my job while they went on a date night. I mean, like you get abused. They take advantage. But, it's, it's changing now. And it yeah. is changing for the better. I agree. But mm -hmm. so we are, in a weird way, television has to and filmmaking has to work like the army it has to work in hierarchy of course um but there's times within that that people have abused their power yeah. as well but i also yeah. think it all comes down to ego yeah the entire yeah. thing 100%. and it's like oh, i'm the director i can behave like this yeah. i'm the actor i can behave like that mm -hmm. we can be in a hierarchy we can have respect but you don't have to treat people badly at all you can still treat people in a human way mm -hmm. and i do think discipline helps like i th think the way that i went into the industry the old school way which mm -hmm. was quite bullying and quite harsh but i learned a, i learned the good parts of that and the bad parts of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm generally super nice on set, yeah. but I'm also very strict in yeah. what I want to achieve. Yeah, you have expectations values. and standards, but you're not going to be a dick about it the whole time. Well, because exactly. you know what it feels like to. Sometimes you have to, that pendulum has to swing so extreme so you can say, I don't want to be like this. Mm. I want to be one of the good directors. And out of a handful of the bad people, not even just directors, I mean, any team leaders on sets, majority of the people in Hollywood were phenomenal. But those a couple bad ones just really yeah. speak volume. But you just learn. I will never treat mm -hmm. actors like that. I'll never treat my crew like that. And mm -hmm. I like how you said you kind of went through it and realized a similar situation. But I, we talk about it now. I think that's the difference. There was there's a lot of over the years badly behaved people in high positions mm -hmm. and actors. Yeah. But we would never. We just move on to the next job, and it was never spoken about. Right. Because you didn't want to badmouth people right. and stuff. But actually, we need to talk about it. And at what what is happening now which is a good thing and this is what i preach to a lot of young actors is in an industry where you have very little control the one thing you can control is your reputation mm -hmm. and i'm just doing a big casting now for a new tv show and we look through all these names of the people that we're going to cast and the first question is not are they a good actor is are they a good person mm -hmm. what is their reputation like because do i want to work with this person there's a lot of people that can act out there and there's a lot of people qualified at the same level. So it comes down to us wanting to work with people and good people. Yeah. And each project to try and get a good team and really mm -hmm. enjoy it. And and then I think we get good performances. Yeah, that's the way it works. Going it that good way. cohesive unit. You don't want, they have a bunch of red flags and headaches. Yeah. Like, that's not going to be worth, I don't care if they're known for that. If, if they're going to be a headache on set. It's going to be a crappy project. You're building a good set culture. Set culture is probably yep. really important these days, too, especially if you're in close proximity for 12 to 18 hours a day with these people and oh, exhaustion. Yeah. You want to make sure you like abroad. each other. Yeah. Yeah, I that, think about that. That's the other thing. You are, I mean, you know what it's like. Yeah. A bit like if you go with the in-laws on holiday or something, <laughs> yeah. but you can't escape. Yeah. So um, I did a big show that we were for Sky that were called A Town Called Malice, and it was an 80s show, and it was all set in Tenerife on an island. Um, but when I was casting, I was very careful about who I picked because mm -hmm. I was. we had to have synergy between everybody because we were in hotels and all together for months and months. Mm -hmm. And that's where stress is happening. Yeah. If you have one bad apple in there, it's just not worth it. Yeah. Well, let's go backwards a little. You're traveling abroad. That's how we met you. Mm. Um, you started with kind of doing music stuff after that. That was your first major push into the production. So I did music videos uh -huh. for quite a long time. Um, and it was good. It was great. Music videos were a great grounding and, I, I learned so much. You just get thrown into a situation. You just have to make it work. Mm -hmm. Very little budget. Um, <laughs> and it's, we just shoot wherever we can. Things that get thrown up. in the, And it taught me to think on my feet, mm -hmm. which was great. We did really well. And I had a production mm -hmm. company up in Leeds. And we launched a lot of new artists. But I suddenly realized I was becoming a director of a company um, as opposed to a director in oh. TV or music. And I was working on payroll and I was had all these staff um, and it was like, this isn't what I wanted to do. And it, and it was really hard when you've got something that on the surface is successful, but not becoming creatively fulfilling mm -hmm. and you're going off on another path. Mm -hmm. 
and to give up something that feels like it's going to be a good success, but not something deep in your heart that you want. And it was it took me a long time to let that go and go, I need to make another decision. Yeah. I need to make another, go another direction to get creatively fulfilled. So I had a massive, very early midlife crisis and moved down to London. Yeah. So that, yeah. Were there fears that kicked in at all? Like, what am I doing? I'm leaving a successful business. Yeah. I'm taking a of leap that? of faith. How? Yeah. How did you get your mindset to say? To shift your focus to the new nice. goal of life. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, it's a lot of soul searching and it's a lot of questioning yourself. Are you doing the right thing? Because I wanted to move into drama. And one of the hard things is when you don't have a clear path. And in, I don't know in other industries, but in TV and film, how do you become a director? How do you become an actor? Everybody's got a different journey. So there's not a path that you can follow. It's not like becoming a doctor of seven years mm -hmm. at university and stuff. So it was really tricky and it was a massive risk and it was scary. And I moved down to London and I couldn't work a way of how to, how to get me into TV. Yeah. And what was hard was that all my success before in my music videos, nobody cared about because it was, even though it was the same industry, it was a different part of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it was a lot of positive thinking. And I honestly believe like once I changed my mindset, like what the universe brought me in such a weird way, which was there was nobody would sign me to be a director a few and they were saying oh you need to make a short film not just music videos so we can see what you can do mm -hmm. and then completely randomly out of nowhere my godfather was building um he was building houses in kosovo so for those who don't know kosovo is next to albania it was part of a big balkan war mm -hmm. um, when yugoslavia broke up and they'd come out of the back end of the war and it was this place that was flourishing and just completely rebuilding the city and he was building houses there he said will you come for two three days and um help me shoot a commercial so i was like yeah i'll go for a bit of a laugh went out there and then on the second day the icelandic volcano erupted whoa mm -hmm. and it grounded <laughs> all flights for five weeks and i got completely stuck there and that was that was the moment is that i can pinpoint that changed my life mm -hmm. Um, and it's, I'm really grateful that I can have a moment and go, that was it there. Um, and I met the people from Kosovo and I learned what had happened in, to the history and what they were living through. And I was just so inspired by them. And I was mostly inspired that nobody really knew their story of what had happened. And it was, it was genocide in a way on the levels of World War II. Um, but there was such a positivity coming out the back of it about what could be. So I was like, I want to... I want to tell this story. I want to tell a, a story of people in this war. This can be my short. So I went back to back to London. I was like, I've got it. I'm going to make this short. This is it. Short doing a short was the breakthrough yeah. to get in. Uh -huh. And nobody cared. Nobody gave me any money. And they were all like, <laughs> "You want to go to an ex-Yugoslav country in a language that you don't speak? Yeah. Make a short film." And this is. So nobody helped me at all. So I was like, what the hell am I going to do? You got the gang together and said, let's do this. Well, my gang wasn't there anymore because mm -hmm. I'd left and gone to London on my own and I needed money to make the film. So I took a job building garden sheds and like log cabins. And I did that for four years and going back and forth to Kosovo, trying to learn the language, learn as much of the culture as I could and then wrote my film and saved up enough money and then wrote what's called shock you funded means, it like, yourself um we funded it myself my producer harvey and um and this movie shock this little short film led you to some pretty big opportunities and on an award show right it was crazy so <laughs> i i mean i made the film and i think looking back very quickly it didn't become about oh i'm making a film to try and get an agent or to get me into drama i didn't care about any of that I skipped all that it, it well it <laughs> it became about why am i doing this and yeah. it was this inner passion to tell this story of these people and it wasn't about me anymore That's it amazing. was so i just kept driving through with that and made the film no idea whether anybody would like it or not and then the first festival it got into was aspen did you submit it to all of them? Started. Everyone was, oh, you need these strategies. Right. And, all of, and I was like, I've got a thousand pounds saved up. I'm just going to shove it I'm in all these places. Threw it anywhere. Uh -huh. 
the first film festival I got back, I think, was Bermuda. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, it's going to be great going to Bermuda. Yeah. Rejection. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, I'm shit. What have I done? Because this was, in my head, my last opportunity. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and then Aspen came in and I premiered at Aspen, went out to Aspen, and then we won all three awards at Aspen, which had never been done before. And then that's where it's changed. And then I think we went 22 festivals back to back and won them all. And then crazily got nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> so what was that call that like? That's the coolest. The Aca- this is the Academy calling. It wasn't. It, so was it, an it wasn't a guy. call. It wasn't <laughs> a call. It was. I started getting. I started getting pings on Facebook Mm -hmm. and everyone going, oh my God, congratulations, congratulations. You found out through media, essentially. Yeah. And I was like, what are they on? And the list had been published and I'd been long listed, which meant that you get to 10. And then from that 10, you go through a whole system and you get it down to five. But I found out I'd been long listed through other people telling me. So I'd I'd completely forgotten it was coming out the list i never thought i'd get get a long list nomination and then yeah so we found out we were nominated um on the long list of nominations but to get properly nominated to actually go to the oscars you need to get down to five so you need to start your campaign and then when you get to the five which was announced in january that's live on tv when they uh when they announce it so i went with harvey over to kosovo and we were in the hotel room waiting and we were like okay so it's gonna come out on the tv and harvey's like look the custom government have arranged this big thing they've booked out this huge bar we're gonna have the tvs on there and we're gonna listen to see if you get nominated yeah. live because this was the first would have been the first ever nomination for kosovo it's got the chills and bear yeah. bear in you mind filmed it did you remember seeing yeah. it yeah i remember watching well, we it. filmed it because yeah. i wasn't going to go to it because on the night i was like i don't want to do it harvey because if we don't get nominated, can hurt. you imagine how deflating it is with everybody there? Mm-hmm. So I was like, I don't want to do it. I just want to sit on my own. And he was like, yeah, but imagine if we do get nominated, mm. you will regret it for the rest of your life not yeah. being there. So we went and we got, yeah, we got nominated. You can watch the clip on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. We'll, 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 we'll put plug it in, in yeah. for yeah. such yeah. a yeah. 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 It's, it's insane. It's, it, you just feel the emotion in the room. It was so awesome. But it, the thing was that it wasn't about the short film anymore. Right. It, it would become it about become about Kosovo because mm-hmm. back then Kosovo wasn't even recognised properly as a country. But yet it, it had an Oscar nomination. Mm-hmm. So having that stamp of approval meant so much mm-hmm. and having the world see what had happened over there. So... Yeah, it was it was so it was cool. madness, and then of course we came to LA, and then we did the Oscar campaign. Yeah, that's so cool. And we hung out with we, you guys I'll at say the... we went to the after party, right? <laughs> yeah, I remember. We joined afterwards. you guys at what was the the Hilton? Not the Hilton. Some What's hotel the, out. It was like yeah. outside Beverly, in the, the Beverly bar. Hilton. Mm. The Beverly Hotel. I don't know. I just remember we dressed up nice just to go say hey to you guys because you're in town. <laughs> yeah, it was we, so. We weird. had that place in the Hollywood Hills. Yeah, it was that's so right. much fun. We had a great time with y'all. Mm. Did you find that holding the intention is what made it successful for you when everybody kept telling you no? Holding that idea that it's about helping people and it's about telling the story instead yeah. of just about you making yeah. it somewhere. What else. do you think kind of got you through those darker moments when everybody said, when everybody was saying no and passing? It's you go through numerous emotions up and down and they can it can get into your head of people saying no but i believe if I, because i was doing things for the right reason because i was driving through and had that determination to do it mm-hmm. that's that was what got me through but it's, it wasn't all joy it was a lot of a lot of ups and downs but i do i have found over the years and and like retrospectively looking back people always want to find a reason to say no mm-hmm. as opposed to yes easier and I do think there's a massive difference between in uh, between the UK and America in mindset of what's possible as well. And there's and I found over here there's a lot more positivity in some way of why not we can do this. Mm-hmm. Whereas I've grown up in a way that people have found a way not to, not not to be positive, but always a reason to find yeah. Yeah. to say no. Mm-hmm. So easier. I had to drive through it. Of course it's easier. It's a small town and be like, oh, this family, we just work at this place mm-hmm. or we move to the plant or we do construction. Like we don't do, we don't go off and make feature films for 
Well, and the sun the shines a little bit more here in the States, so that mm. tends to help people's mental. We talked about that at yeah. one point, right? That sometimes yeah. there's that gloom mental state because it's so gloomy in the... Is it like that in Leeds too, or is that mainly just London? London. Uh, London's better than Leeds for is blue. It really? Well, the the more north you go, the more rain and gray it oh, is. Oh yeah, yeah. The gray <laughs> life, but it brings out that that hipster creativity, <laughs> I guess. But it was it's tough battling through and knowing whether you're making the right decision mm -hmm. or not. Um, and why did it happen? I don't know. As I say, I believe I was making things for the right reason, trying to be a good person. But also, I'd had years and years of skills building up, and I was ready for it. Mm -hmm. And I put everything into that film. And I was, look, I was lucky. You know, it's like winning the lottery, getting nominated yeah. for an Oscar. Yeah. And I saw a lot of films. I was on the festival circuit for nearly two years, and there was amazing films that should have been nominated that never got there as well. Mm -hmm. So, so if it weren't for natural disasters and volcanoes, you wouldn't have made it. Right? Do you feel like that moment? <laughs> kind of stuck you there that was volcano. part of your it was, it was all part of your path yeah completely and you you look back and it is it determined path is it the universe bringing you things you don't know but I, so, but right? when i changed my mindset i do remember changing my mindset and being positive about things mm -hmm. yeah. and that's where things did change we always say that to each other fate or coincidence mm -hmm. you never know and does it matter yeah. i guess no. you're here so since the oscars what have what I have, have you a been doing? Oh, okay, yeah. Movie, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Just Go going back, you when you had the whole idea to make the movie, what were your first thoughts when it came to the language barrier? Like, how am I going to do this? Like, it will, translators. Well, f I made a very clear decision. It had to be in Albanian. Make it so real. In, in Kosovo, they speak Albanian. Mm -hmm. But if I changed it for an for an international audience it would take away language was such an important thing for them there and when the serbs invaded in kosovo one of the things that they did was they took the language away from them so it means so much to them but i had to be true and i wanted it to be in its local language um and i was also struggling with i don't want to be seen as a foreigner coming over and taking stories and just putting them out there, I wanted to be true. So that's why it took so long learning the culture. There's so much hidden in that film that you would only understand if you were Albanian or Kosovan. That doesn't mean anything to um, to a lot of the international audience. But there's little nuggets in there, which hopefully shows my respect towards the people there. And a lot of people didn't realise I wasn't Albanian when I was oh. the director on that. So language wise was a massive thing. So I learned as much as I could. I'm terrible at languages <laughs> and Albanian is so hard to I learn. Heard that, but yeah. I was I was okay with it. Um I had translators. Mm -hmm. But one of the greatest things that I found with it was it didn't matter if you couldn't fully speak the language because you can feel a good performance and I would know if it was the right take because I could feel it inside me when I was there and I'd have my script supervisor next to me and I would check the little nuances of the language and did they do that right? Yes, they did. But I'd go, that's the take. Mm -hmm. And I've taken that on into my work now that you feel a good performance mm -hmm. as opposed to listening, are they saying the words correctly? So I learned a lot from directing in a different language. Wow. That's awesome. Because if they can move you and on set, then hopefully they can move the audience viewing it. Of course. It. Yeah, of course. it's awesome. So since Shock has come out, what's been next? Have you found there are more opportunities? Does it give you more street cred, as we say here in the States? It's very tricky to then, I then had to make a decision to choose what's my path. Mm -hmm. Because you can keep it making short films or you can try and go into the film side um, and make movies or back then there was the television side so around that mm -hmm. time which was 2016 tv was just exploding that's where all the work was mm -hmm. also i was in so much debt from <laughs> years of trying to make this film um but i moved into television because that's where the opportunities were and it's a good training ground you were at the academy awards you're a super rich hollywood director though how are you in debt <laughs> It's, there's people think everybody's got so much money in it. it is you just show up in a suit to the academy yeah. where it's like that guy's made it you're like yeah. i am scratching for my life right well, and you won all those all those festivals i'm sure those came with checks yeah they and obviously not, cut you a million dollar check every time you and you all your travel was covered and... you get a nice little plastic trophy 
<laughs> which you can order down the street, yeah. customize, put your yeah. name on it. But your Director flights of the year. and your food, everything was covered at festivals, right? Yeah, that's what people don't realize. You just getting to all these places and the whole team, like you're going in debt just to try to be a part of this stuff. Of course. Right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, the cost of an Oscar campaign, even for a short film, is insane. Yeah. So what does that mean, a campaign? You had to get it out there to get the public vote? Is that how it worked for it, you? To get the Academy members vote. I to describe get you on to the top five. No, once you are down to the top five, you then have to campaign for six weeks to get the mem- to get the branch or all the academy members to go. I'm going to pick this film out of these mm-hmm. five nominees. So it's changed a little bit now. Like bribery. It's well, they're very strict on that as well because there's a very fine line with it. So it's best described as like a. American presidential campaign is quite like that. You get funding and you push on why you should pick me. <laughs> well, it's a lot. It's like a general day when you're sort of campaign. You wake up in the morning, you do a couple of radio shows or podcasts talking about your film. You get to lunchtime, you do um, some sort of video on screen, I don't know, interview like that. And then you get to the afternoon and then you do a screening and we'd constantly move around. So we'd fly from LA to New York and do screenings there, then do Q and A's. And then we would be at event parties on an evening to like two, three in the morning. And you're paying for all this out of your pocket. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Just to promote them at the end of the day, their show to pick you as the best. I mean, it does come around because what in full disclosure, what you end up doing is when you get, when you get nominated, your film's worth money then. So you sign a distribution deal. Mm -hmm. So, you will so we would sign a dis- we signed a distribution deal with a company and they gave us an advance for what they believe the film would earn so we would use some of that money on our campaign oh, great oh, that's good yeah yeah there's is something it, there's a still... cheap way to do it yeah. but we went for it <laughs> like, like we're gonna make it let's go <laughs> oh it was well you saw we went hollywood hills yeah. house we went escalade we're like <laughs> harvey and i we sat in london <laughs> and we were like how are we gonna do this yeah because we can go super cheap and not put it into PR, or we could just throw everything into it. And again, Harvey gave me great advice. Like he said, let's go to, mm-hmm. um, let's let the cameras in and, you know, do um, and be at that event when we got nominated. He said the same thing then. He said, this could be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Let's do it properly. Let's enjoy it. Let's experience it the way it should be. Let's throw every single penny we've got at it. And then that way, there is no regrets. I love at all. him so Shout much. out to Harvey. Mm. We had some good Harvey times. Harvey Scott. Yeah. <laughs> love him. Okay, so picking up to where you left off. So you had to decide, do you want to take the TV route, mm-hmm. the film route? How'd you know which direction to go? And were people just throwing offers your way now that you have this? I got a great agent off the back okay. of it. So that, that was ha- the next step? Yeah. Get an agent. Okay. Um, and did you have an international agent or did you have somebody that worked strictly for you in Leeds? Yeah, yeah. Um, in in the UK. My mm-hmm. agent was based in the UK, um, but they had a lot of international ties as well. Um, yeah. And I, I, at the time, the industry was focused around television. That's where the work was. It's a And it's a great sort of learn training ground as well. So we, yeah, I went, I went for television and normally a lot of people a lot of directors work their way up so they start on you know um we had shows like casualty and doctors uh, or soaps and then you build your cv up yeah same here um luckily i went in and my first job i got was a show called the last kingdom which is yeah. a massive Very show known. for bbc and netflix mm-hmm. And I managed to nail that for my first show, which was incredible. So I went from like a crew of like 15 people to like a thousand, 300 extras. And it was, it was insane, but it was great. Did you guys, was it basically like a full feature where you do like table reads and everything? What was that experience like walking in and it's a, it's a big deal all of a sudden. And you're like, you're the man, everyone's looking at you like, how was it? You're (laughs) like, (laughs) like, what do you do? Well, because a lot of a lot of people in the industry work their way up, so they know how systems okay. work. I hadn't done it. I'd been on the outside and came in like you came. So, in, yeah, you came in kind of like Which laterally. Nice. You didn't have any habits to break. You probably but, came in fresh and that's one way. But I, then I had no idea what a lot of people were talking about. Like for ages, <laughs> they were saying essays, 
and I thought it's like some sort of Mexican slang or something. And <laughs> an essay, an essay is is a supporting artist, which is <laughs> the polite way of saying an extra. Uh -huh. So I didn't have all this terminology. So you're calling them extras, and they're like, we don't say that anymore. <laughs> yeah. They're essays. Essays. <laughs> it's not politically correct. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend anyone. <laughs> So I knew all the filming side of stuff, but the mm. politics within it, mm. so it was a crash course. Mm. But I was ready for it yeah. completely. Um, it's, you know, I was, I'd spent a long time building up to this. And it was, it can get overwhelming. Sure. Yeah. But also, what did, I think when people say, oh, did the Oscars help you get this job? Or has it influenced how you work and how yeah, you direct? Write your resume, does it help anything? To be honest, the biggest thing it, taught me was dealing with pressure that when I walked onto the Last Kingdom set and I had all that cast and all that crew and millions on it to spend and it was it could easily get overwhelming and I was like it doesn't matter how much pressure I feel in this job now it's nothing compared to the pressure of being at the Oscars with the weight of the expectation of that film on me so it became a good comparison thing so I feel that experience has allowed me to be that's reasonably great. chill with everything else yeah. and just take things in its stride and we know the oscars here in the states but is it as big of a deal in the uk and over in other countries is it as reputable when you're nominated for an oscar do people like, in wow. the uk are they like oh my gosh you've made it or is it because in the states that's like our big that's yes our big film thing, yes it's you know? still a massive thing i mean yeah. it was huge obviously it was a lot bigger in the states i yeah. remember like everybody has a lot of professional um respect for you in mm -hmm. the UK if you get nominated for an Oscar. But I remember being in LA and being with uh, PR and like jumping queues in clubs <laughs> and getting given free clothes because you were nominated for yeah. an Oscar. It was a massive thing yeah. in LA, bigger than it was anywhere else. And what I mean by that is not, it, it permeated every person in LA, even pe people who worked in shops and restaurants, it was a big thing. Whereas mm -hmm. in the UK, it's, it's more of a big thing within the industry, okay. but it's changed because the Academy is great now. They've really expanded mm -hmm. outside of America and are hugely inclusive in the UK. They've just brought the student Oscars over there. Oh, wow. They're doing so many more events. It's much more of an international scene now and much like, yeah, it's completely gone yeah. diverse and loads great. of people from all over the world. So it's who's, great. Who's your favorite director if you had to pick one from the past? Oh, I'm useless with this question. Are you? I know. All right, then who was like a starstruck <laughs> Or who were you maybe starstruck by that you saw at the Oscars, whether director or, okay, or actor? Okay, that's, that's a better question. Oh, I can give you a favorite director okay. as well, but I'll tell you who I was starstruck. <laughs> was I star Oh, yeah, I think we asked you this. I don't, I don't really get that starstruck, and that's not in a super cool way. Yeah. It's just, They're I'm just not. people. I, I, and I have to have that mindset. Of course. That, otherwise, I will direct in an incorrect way. Mm -hmm. I will be putting people on pedestals. You can respect somebody for their work, but you can't be a sycophant to them. Oh, of course. But there are exceptions. And when I was at the when I was at the Oscars, we have a dinner before a few days before. And I was sat at the table. Um and there's like six of us around this table. And um my other producer, Eshref, was there and he was like, Oh my God, look. And I looked over there and he said, That's Steven Spielberg. He's just walked in. Yeah. And he's like, I'm going to go get a photo. I was like, Eshref, <laughs> please just try and play it cool. Yeah. Maybe towards the end we can sneak a photo, but we're yeah, not running up right to him away. like fanboys. And he's like, no, I'm doing it. I've got to do it. I was like, no, just chill. It's all right. So we're looking at him and I'm like, he's walking over here. So he's coming here. He's coming here. And he literally pulled the chair up next to me, sat down and went, hi, I'm Stephen. I was like, what are you doing here? And he was on the table and he was placed next to us on the you table. Go, I know. <laughs> and, and oh, it was Sorry, incredible. What's your name? <laughs> um, and that is one thing that I absolutely love about the Academy, mm -hmm. the equality in it, because in my head, I was like, well, we're still short film. We're not feature film. We're like the little kid nobody wants. Mm -hmm. No, the equality with it is, is incredible. Yeah. And it just showed that the Academy, when they arranged the tables, they took a short film and the biggest director in the world and put them together on there. I love that. Um, so, yeah, I was a bit, I wasn't starstruck, but I was massively appreciative of yeah. the opportunity. Yeah. With it. It was a cool Did experience. you pick his brain at all or ask him any questions that you're like, I'll never forget that piece of advice? Because he started out doing short films too. Yes. And he's got, he had a huge knowledge. He knew about Kosovo, mm -hmm. which was great. And we talked about that. We, 
he was he was telling us a little bit about the way he filmed, which I do a similar thing, which was encouraging for me, which is editing as we go and trying to have the editor involved in the production along the way so you can adjust as you go. And he was telling me he shoots in that way. So it was reinforcing the way that I approach things is a good way to do it. That's great. So when you check the gate and you've got the shot you want, do you hand it to the editor and say, this is the clip, put this in? We don't check the gate anymore because it's all oh, digital, yeah, that's right. that's unfortunately. Right. I'm archaic. <laughs> um, it works in different way now. So everything's digital files. It gets uploaded, um, transcoded. The editor, I mean, it's set up in TV in this way now. So it's, so it's a good way of doing it. The rushes, so all the raw rushes, so all the raw footage that we shoot, the next day after it being filmed goes up and then certain people have access to watch mm. it. So you have director, producer, um, all the execs can watch it. Um, and then every single week we have assemblies. So every week we take all the footage that we shot and we make a very rough cut of all the different scenes. So on a Friday or maybe a Monday morning, that will get released to bigger set of people, maybe the network execs. Um, so you can begin to build it as you're going and we can see what's working and what's not. So by the time you finish, once you put all those assemblies together, you've got a very long, rough wow. version yeah. of the edit. And it's great because you can adjust as you go, you can see what's working, but you also, as a director, have this constant pressure that people are watching all the time, mm -hmm. every little mm -hmm. thing that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And also everything that you're saying is being recorded as well. <laughs> which is Talk which could be true cancel because, culture yeah <laughs> great job it's everything it's so but you do it in the heat at the moment you say yeah. things and it's mm -hmm. yeah so everything's getting watched all the time wow. um, are you shooting in raw yes raw? Shooting on the red. Raw. what do you guys what do you what do you like to shoot on what's your main i guess it depends on the depends project on the, uh, it depends on the budget i mean most oh, stuff too. is shot on ari alexa mm -hmm. 65 now we shoot on for a lot of things um think the last show and the new show we might be shooting on sony's it all depends on the budget the look we want to get yeah some people love the red um it, it's all about workflow and it's all about data mm -hmm. this is the boring stuff about it now data costs money yeah the yeah. transfer of it and we're talking yeah. gigabytes and gigabytes yeah, that's shooting a four six k it's yeah. crazy do you have any concerns about ai you want to get into ai already yeah talk uh, about it. the thing is AI mm -hmm. could be an incredible tool if it's used right, but we all know it's not going to be used right. Mm -hmm. It's going to be yeah. used for cutting corners, taking jobs out of the way. I'm on about within the industry. Yeah, some, stu sure. some stuff is amazing. Like a, a great example is, um, so we do, it's ADR, which is when we record all the sound of, uh, of the actors like 90 percent of it's great but sometimes you'll miss little words but also when we all put an episode together we're like hang on a second this doesn't make sense mm -hmm. we need to add in little bits of sentences to carve the story so we'll bring the actors in for additional recording and they'll sit in like a studio like this and and re-record on top of it now what we can do with adr in the edit is we can just feed somebody's voice in and say make them say this mm -hmm. And you just get that back of the headshot and the voice will say it and it looks like they're continuing the conversation. Completely. So you're doing all your ADR through AI? No, no. Okay. But he's saying these, are, <laughs> these are pros that will be used. Okay, okay. This is what, what we can do now. Mm -hmm. Now, the great thing about that is that we in the edit can try stuff out because at the moment we don't know whether this ADR line will work until we're in the studio and we put it through the edit. Awesome. So we could run it through ADI and go, well, if they said this, would this land? Can we get away with the lip movements so people mm -hmm, can't test? Mm -hmm. That's great. Before paying the actor, bringing them in, wasting their time, pulling them off another of set. Of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's great. Mm -hmm. But where it will end up is, and we all know this, is like, well, if we've AI'd the voice, why are we going to pay the actor to come right. in and say it again? They're going to start selling their rights. And this is what it comes down yeah. to, the right side of things. Yep. And also... Writers, scripts. Writers, scripts, mm -hmm. but directors as well. How does AI create the things it does it learns off what we've done in the past so it's building off our creativity mm -hmm. taking all of mm -hmm. that and nobody's getting credited for it at all mm -hmm. what are we going to end up with at the end of it so background actors you don't really need them anymore you can no. fill actors you just in, the fill back. in the background like well yeah. they already do it with cgi but now there goes their jobs, CGI jobs. visual yeah. effects yeah they're gone you know yeah. 
So I don't know what it's going to end up like. It might We might end up in falling into sort of two categories where it becomes a marketable thing to say, watch this film or read this novel, no AI involved. Yeah, it's sort of like thing. organic mm. movies. Yeah. yeah. Type Completely. Yeah. Organic movie. Yeah. 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 It's like real people, real results. <laughs> yeah. And then also, you know, movie theaters are a thing of the past. People don't go to theaters to see movies anymore. So how do you get funded and how do you make money? And if you're having to cut stuff. It's all streaming. Yeah. Everything. It's it's coming back round. Everything goes in cycles, yeah. though. Like the streaming bubble, is it bursting a little bit? Not is if the Terminator was real. No. In the movie iRobot, here comes Elon's Tesla robots. They'll just yeah, I like. I saw that the other day. And they're well. talking to people. They're like, they look like the iRobot movie. Would you get one? I if I told you, I've never even sent an emoji. I'm not going to be getting a <laughs> Musk robot. It's like, I don't know. It's, it's worrying and it's. But there'll be some good stuff that comes from oh, it. For sure. Technology's you, great. You've just got to, just, as long as you can't lose that creativity in it. Mm -hmm. And this is why we've got so many tools on set, so many cool things that we can shoot with. But you can very quickly become about the technology. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things about my DP is very early on, he taught me, he's like, he's not into his technology. He's like, it's a tool. I don't care if it can do this or fly around or keep us stabilized like that. If it allows us to get the shot that we want, that's great. But we choose the shot that we want first. Mm -hmm. We don't build things around the possibilities of technology. We build things creatively. And a camera is literally just a tool to enhance that performance and enhance that script. And I think as long as you keep that in your head, when AI comes in, that it's purely a tool. Mm -hmm. But we won't. <laughs> it's, it's, Some won't. So I actually had a question about that, where when you keep getting busier and busier and all these people are on set and now you have a job to do and they expect you to do it in a certain way, how do you make sure you keep that job flowing but also not lose your creativity as what got you there in the first place? It's picking your moments. I always say it's like being a good director is finding moments of creativity amongst the chaos. You have to accept that sometimes you've just got to get certain scenes done. You've got to make your day. Because if you don't, it's called making your day, which is essentially completing mm. the course sheet, getting all the sh all the shots done by a mm. certain point. So you've got to accept you can't have complete creativity in absolutely everything. Some stuff just has to, you've got to sacrifice bits and then find those moments of joy where you can put a little bit in there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a balancing act. Um, and it's also call it like killing your babies which probably isn't great to bring up now <laughs> <laughs> but not making decisions and especially in the edit not making decisions on the amount of time or emotional investment it took to get something to be able to look at something and go in this context it doesn't work it'll be better without forget we spent four weeks planning it two days shooting yeah. it the tears and pain and mm -hmm. lack of sleep around it if it doesn't work get rid of it cut the scene that goes back to you being decisive yeah. you just gotta know be like Make it sucks but get rid fast. of it yeah i don't need it anymore what's for the future of you what's coming what's next what, what would be your next goal i just want to work on great things and it's it's this what's great to you it's working on whatever whatever it's film or television um, but also having creative control within it as well. So writing my own things, getting them off the ground, shooting those shows. So I have creative control over all of it, which would be great. Just working on amazing TV shows, moving back into film as well, coming full circle. Like I started started in film that got me over the line and into the industry. And I've a bit like what happened on my music videos and becoming a director of a company, I've diverted down the TV route, and I'm massively appreciative of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I also want to come back around and make film as well. What and would be your dream film, the dream job? Uh, my dream film is what I will make one day, which is the follow-on to my short, which is a bigger look. Feature version? Of, yes, a feature version, which I, I won't go fully into, but it's, it's yeah. really, it, it's a real crossover between America and Kosovo. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's in a way it's it looks at it looks at America, it looks at the West and it looks at what happened in Kosovo and incredible stories within it. Sounds awesome. Yeah. You know, America, we love our war stories. Well, this a lot of yeah. people look, you know, America is 
it's it's debatable how they behave mm -hmm. and the war. But I tell you what, if anybody's ever unsure, look at what America did in Kosovo. Look at what Madeleine Albright and um, Bill Clinton did. Um, that was war for good. I mean, I don't know what their massive intentions were, but they sa they massively saved a nation as well. And yeah. the love for America <laughs> in Kosovo is incredible. They have a day called Thank You America Day. That's Aww. amazing. You know, there's American flags flying everywhere. You have Bill Clinton Boulevard. The <laughs> the the gratefulness over there for and for what they did. And the UK came over as well as, you know, there is I think Don't there's try to take the credit all of a sudden. <laughs> the, you know there's there's fifty two kids in Kosovo whose first name is Tony Blair. What? Yeah named after tony blair for what wow. they did as well That's so, so cool. and people don't even know the story and we you, had no idea until you told us about it look into it it yeah. is is incredible you know what what they did there so um yeah feature Favorite, version of that feature version mm -hmm. of that favorite genre to direct would be drama i think so i'm into i'm not really I'm, I'm so open in everything it's like favorite yeah. like what you like in music as well yeah. as long as it's good storytelling mm -hmm. I was never massively into horror until recently, and then I've just been offered a horror film, and it's like I'm going to have to start watching horror. Yeah, um, get the idea. Of and I watched What's the one we just watched that I couldn't finish because it was so creepy. Oh, God. It wasn't really a horror film, but it was like those mental. It was just a realistic. It was the same guy who did Split, uh, the actor, not the director, did you see the actor. That? But either way, it was about a couple that went on vacation, met another couple, thought they were friendly. So they're like, you should come out to our house out in the country sometime. Ew, it was so And they ended disturbing. up being like sickos who murder people. Yeah, it's, just... it's, I've never been great with horror. I just uh -huh. watched for the first time Paranormal Activity. <gasps> oh, that's, that's way off the deep end. Do you like more psychological yeah. horrors or do you like more blood and guts horror films? What, or... Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, what do you like? I would say more. I don't like any of them. I just get too scared. <laughs> but I've I've had to learn to like. Have them. you watched The Grudge? No, I've just watched It Follows and Paranormal Activity. Uh -huh. But I'm no expert on this whatsoever. Like The Sixth Sense. Are you into those psychological? Oh, so, so, yeah, I prefer. Like, I I do like twist, psychological good twist. thriller. That's not mm. really. I love sci-fi. Yeah, I love a, a thriller. Are you a sci-fi fan? Yeah, so okay. I think like so. Fifth Element. Yeah, Fifth Element. Sounds I've like, not seen it in years, but it was good. I'm just trails, saying, and... you know, I'm trying to convince David to name our baby boy Corbin. Corbin uh, Dallas. That's the name of the, that's the name Bruce of Bruce Willis in that movie. I love uh, the name Corbin. Sweet. Well, um, I think I have one other question for you. Okay, oh, fine. someone's starting out. Yeah. What do you, th what advice would you get to give to them? The young kid who just moved to LA at 18, who's like, I want to make it as I a director. want to be a director. What's what are the steps they should make? Just keep building their creativity. What do you think? Get a job. First of all, don't let your job determine you. That's I think it's a massive thing. People people get so invested in it, and oh, I've not made it by this point, and it's a reflection on me. It's not that. That's not who you are. And it's the same with actors as well. That don't feel that they've made it, and their identity is them being an actor. Their identity is them being a director and are successful. Get that out of your head. It's not a good mental state to be in. It's it's a very tricky industry, and there's no set path. So I think there's it's determination and hard work, but you don't get crazy about it. You, you know, don't define yourself by it. What I would say is going back to what we said before, which is learning every single part of the industry you can. And learn to learn to just be a good person. First of all, don't underestimate how much people want to work with good people as well. So protect and build your reputation. That's the first thing. And um, yeah, just don't get knocked back. There is always a possibility at the end that, that you will get there, and it might be luck. It might. It's a mixture of luck, and it's a mixture of very hard work, and it's talent. Um, and there's no path. But right. and. Do you know what? If you make it fantastic, I hate the word make it, but if you get to where you want to get to fantastic, and if you don't, it's all good. And you might find something else along the way as well. Mm -hmm. right. Do you find that making their own stuff, like building your own portfolio is important? Staying creative. Yeah. Like if you want to be a director, start making, writing your own films, just be constantly be in the industry that you want to be in. Completely. Or being more in the business side of it. Well, it's like LA. Everyone's an actor, but also a server. So what do you do? You try making your short films. Let's like stay. Of course. Um, invest in yourself or how, what, well, you know, how do you keep somebody? Well, you've got to keep grounded within it as well. And it's like the fact I built garden sheds as well. I will never, I'll never forget. 
and I'd still love doing it. Mm -hmm. So you need that constant balance between it. Um, and what was your question again? What was the first uh, part of it? It's staying in the business side of the creative or building your portfolio. How important is all of that? Oh, keep, yeah. yeah. Making your own stuff is massively important as well because it allows you to experiment. It allows you to see what works and just driving through. In the early days when we had that music video company um, and I met somebody, my business partner there, what he was great at was he was great at ringing me on a Saturday morning and he's like, let's go film something. I'm like, oh, and he's like, no, we're going to film something. Every single weekend we're going to make something. And it doesn't matter what you work on, you learn something from every single job. Mm -hmm. And I remember I did The Last Kingdom, which is a huge multi-million pound Netflix thing. I came back and I went and did a corporate video about an eco house with Adam, who we know, our <laughs> friend there, and we were filming in like a boiler inside a cupboard. <laughs> but I went from that to that because I was, I still learned something off that. Mm -hmm. You'll come up with a shot idea or you'll remember something or you'll, in, or you'll have to get a performance out of somebody who's not an actor. So um, don't turn your nose up at anything. And opportunities can be anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the thing. I mean, look at Kosovo, look at... You just don't a, um, helps you learn on the job big time completely and yeah. it's funny as you can go look back at those now and like way back in the day when you did it and realize how far you've come because mm. there are some crappy yeah. <laughs> god i hate i hate we everything that i make we did everything too. but if you go back to when you were young making something you're like oh my gosh yeah. like we did a hulu series and a netflix documentary and people are like oh that's so cool but we just to us, we're like, oh, it could be. It, it, it's never finished. The projects are never finished because you always want them to be better. You always want to add this. You, you know, it's hard to, at some point to say it's done. It's good enough as it is. The next project will just keep learning and evolving and getting better. But I love the feedback you gave. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's never finished, and I don't think you ever should be happy with anything mm -hmm. because then the day I'm like, that's perfect, that's great. It's okay. like, where do I go from there? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. from here, maybe you do a big feature and a big job on Shock, the sequel, but the real story, the whole thing, right? I hope big so. Big picture. We Anything love else it. for him? I just love you. I'm, I'm so glad you're here. I know you, you've got lots of things to do and people to see while you're here. So thank you for carving out time for us. Yes. And we'll have to see you out here in the summer. Take Definitely. you on the boat. Go to Crab Island. That's right. I'm loving it. I'm coming back here again. Yeah, you are. And if you guys haven't seen it shock where can it's they online. watch it um it's online it's on vimeo and it's on youtube it's s-h-o-k which means friend in albanian love it there and if go. people want to stay in touch with you can't do instagram it's his yet, favorite but... he's the biggest social butterfly on instagram <laughs> i i do have an instagram yes i do i'm just send him a follow not great at all of that but you can follow me yes yeah, awesome. we'll put it up here on the screen too Perfect. thank you for your time Thanks. so Sorry. good to see you yeah see you guys